This is Julie Pearson, Little Thunder. Today is Saturday, September 16th, mm -hmm. 2017, and I'm interviewing Bill Streck for the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at Oklahoma State University. Bill, you graduated from OSU, went on to University of Missouri and University of Rochester to complete medical training and served as a professor of clinical medicine, then worked as CEO of an academic medical center. You've been involved with healthcare policy uh, councils for many years, but our interview is going to focus on your undergraduate experiences here and your involvement with the Friday Afternoon Tea and Glee Society. Mm -hmm. Where were you born and where did you grow up? Well, I was born in Parsons, Kansas, and uh, moved to Oklahoma City, Oklahoma when I was eight. So I consider myself an Oklahoman in truth. And my family, all of us grew up in Oklahoma City. I still have two sisters in that city, so that I would always call home. Nice. What did your parents do for a living? My father was in uh, the building construction trade initially as a sales representative for many years, and then at the latter stages of his career, he was the president of a building supply company. And my mother was a church secretary for most of her career. And I have three other, I have three siblings, and I'm the oldest, a brother, and then two sisters. And we are all Oklahomans, I would say. That's the one thing that we will always claim. What was it like growing up in Oklahoma City? Although you have a lot of memories of Parsons, too, I imagine. Uh, limited memories of Parsons. Okay. Oklahoma City was, um, as much as uh, young people have memories, they were happy memories of, of a great family. We were very involved with the church at that time, the minority group that we were being Catholics in Oklahoma in that, that period of time. So we were, the family was very oriented around Christ the King Parish, in the northern part of uh, Oklahoma City. And that really, that's always was sort of the lodestone of uh, the family life and, and church life. How, any school experiences that kind of indicated the road you would eventually take in your life in terms of career? Well, um, the one in interesting in a way thing was that I went to uh, private uh, Catholic boys school. It was a sort of a pre-seminary, mm -hmm. clearly premature at that age, but um, it, was a, it was a very uh, life-influencing experience for me because it was an extremely liberal education in terms of philosophy, social philosophy, church theology at that time as opposed to now was uh, really, uh, it was the, the quote liberal gospel and social justice was a large part of my high school education. So I felt that was, that was significant. And my parents were um, Kennedy Democrats. So that was a transition phase. I mean, they had always been Democrats. But as we got into the, the Vietnam War and all the things that then started abutting with the college experience, it, it was hard on a lot of families. It was hard for my dad, um, I mean, he's always a wonderful man and loyal to everyone and just a rock of integrity, but it was hard for him to um, experience his sons, uh, both my brother and I had difficulty being supportive of the war, and so that transition, which we worked through eventually, but it was hard. How old were you at that time? Well, that would have been when I was a, a freshman, probably a freshman in college. You are already here. Yeah. How did you end up at OSU? Uh, inadvertently. I actually uh, went to college at uh, Rockhurst College in Kansas City, which is a Jesuit college. And uh, I had a very successful first semester, save for the fact that uh, the prefect in our dorm found uh, beer bottles in in uh, my roommate and my room, and we, the two of us, uh, 
in my mind, always in retrospect, were made sacrificial lambs to a, a discipline they could not enforce, and I was actually forced to withdraw. Mm -hmm. So then I came to Oklahoma State uh, because I had more acquaintances here, uh, more friends, and uh, Frank McFarland, Dr. McFarland, was the dean at that time, and it took a special hearing with him to get me into Oklahoma State University. He was very generous because the admissions office had admitted me until they learned of my indiscretion and then they had withdrawn the forms. I had to come back the next day and talk to the dean. The irony of that is that not lost on me was that three years later I was working with Dr. McFarland on one of the, the uh, college committees on something on discipline or something like that. There was just there was a little <laughs> irony in the whole thing. So. Yes. And I'm, yes. Um, now I want to get this straight. So the the school that you'd come from, though, were you kind of on a seminary path? Is that no, no, you it were was thinking? no. Oh. I had I had left. It no, just I was, just was going to college. You right? were just going to school there, right? Okay. When you were admitted, did you had you decided what you were going to major on, or did you discover that? I felt. I always felt an allure toward medicine, so I, I was pre-med and uh, had hopes, but I, I never felt that there was any guarantee that I could get into medical school. And I remember at that time, Johnson was president and uh, there was talk of socialized medicine, and it, it, it sort of appealed to me. I thought, you know, doctors just get paid a, you know, a fixed amount, take care of people, you organize things. So even then it had a very naive and uneducated allure. But I took, I majored in psychology and minored in English, the psychology so I would have a career in English because I loved it. <laughs> and then I took all my other courses were in philosophy and there was a professor named Gerald Clements who was a, a great philosophy professor. And I took every course I could with him and my premise was that I would take the minimal amount of math and science to get into medical school so that I could be educated when I got there, if I got there. And I, physics and some of the courses here just I found excruciating. But I got through that stuff and then got admitted to medical school. Right about the time there was a lot of consternation about draft lottery numbers mm -hmm. so that uh, I was deferred because I had gotten into medical school, and I, I don't remember exactly, but I think my lottery number would have put me in the reachable group mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of luck for many of us during those years. Right, especially feeling the way you did about the war. Well, yes, but I, I had ambivalence about the war, but I think, to be honest, the main thing is I didn't want to go. Mm -hmm. That was it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, uh, both at the Newman Center, and I've since learned at the Wesley Center here, you know, there were a lot of people who had a lot of concerns, and, and I was exposed to them on the campus, and um, there was a certain resonance with the discomfort. Right. Um, going back to Dr. Clements quickly, what did you like about his classes? Well, his, his, the emphasis in his philosophy was the philosophy of language. Wittgenstein and some of these philosophers who really focused on language as a way of communication. And I, I just found that fascinating. I always have been fascinated by language, but communication and language and philosophy and how I say that's a chair, how do you know it's a chair, it just, it was a way of thinking and he was just great. He was great at it. I've since seen in our little alumni thing that he, he died a few years ago, but I will always be grateful to him for just expanding the way I thought about language and philosophy and words. They, they were great experiences. What were some of your other favorite classes? Well, there was an English professor. And I, I, before I came for this interview, I tried to catch someone because I'm sure she would know his name. And I forgot his name, but he was very idiosyncratic. He only had classes at 7.30 in the morning because he only wanted students who wanted to take his course and I That's took, a good way to win I took as many courses with him. He was very demanding. He was very demanding. He was a great guy. And I, I'm embarrassed that for this interview, I didn't bother to try to track down his name. <laughs> but it, he, was, he was a very, very demanding guy. Unusually so, I will say. 
And then, of course, you know, the 7.30 time frame was clearly illustrative of his approach. Right, right. I, I love that. It's a great strategy. So how about social activities on or off campus? That is really a vague part of my memory of OSU. It you were really a serious is. student. I was, I was a student. I, I think I was serious. Um, a lot of stuff uh, centered, at least in the first few years, around the social programs at the Newman Center, the Catholic Center, uh, brought in Cesar Chavez and the Berrigans. I mean, there was a very activist component there. And I was comfortable with that and uh, a lot of the people there. But the, I mean, I was, I was an independent. I was not in a fraternity. Um, I wouldn't say, you know, I was uh, immensely popular in any circles. <laughs> I had I met a number of wonderful people, and I had I had friends, but it was a pretty relaxed enterprise. Right. I think it was probably my junior year that I became more active in politics, and then that created another circle of of colleagues, and that's where Ken and I, Ken Doms and I connected, and then I guess it was it must have been my senior year that. I ran for the student senate purposefully. I was involved in the politics before that, sort of in the background, understanding the parties, and you know, there's nothing uh, more intense than something unimportant like a college political party. <laughs> but there was a lot of you know, there was a lot of back and forth and things, and you know, our party wanted to win, and there was, I mean, there were political differences on the campus before things really started flaring, and then. My senior year, I would say, was uh, mostly spent in those activities and then working with the Student Senate, Margaret Brooks and all the dilemmas there, the speaker's policies, that, that became a kind of a consuming thing on that side. On the other side, you know, it was just, I had a lot of nice friends, we uh, did things together, and, but it was uh, not memorable. You know, other than it was college, right. and it was good to be in college. <laughs> um, were you involved with the drummer at all? I was not involved okay. with the drummer, other than being a reader. Okay. Yes. And, I mean, I knew who Ron Stevens was, and I knew some of the people, but I, was, I would never claim to be at the epicenter of that creative endeavor and a lot of the creative things that were going on the campus. I, I was more linear, I would say. I mean, I was studying for medical school. I, the Senate was the transition to actually step in and become more activist. Right, because you, you'd run for that office with what in mind? What um, kinds of changes did you want to see? Well, we were there was just increasing discomfort about the campus. It was just um, banning the ACLU from using the campus. Um, and this came before the the OSU campus speakers policy. Yeah, that, that was the, for, one, that was one of the triggers. Can you talk about that a little bit? I the director of the student union took it upon himself to ban the ACLU from using the facilities. It wasn't even a speech; it was just for a meeting. Wow! And and so that that rankled people because you guys paid your fees to. Yeah, we didn't think of it in that sophisticated a term. It just didn't seem, it seemed odd. So, um, and it just, it just slowly built where, uh, as a, in my viewpoint, there were, there were true thinkers and leaders of which I would not number myself. Um, created the drummer, followed some of these things through. Um, and then some of us, like myself, joined and we had politically organizing instincts, you know, how to extend this, and, and, and the coalition built around really the principles. It was not a coalition built mm -hmm. on uh, lifetime friendships or a fraternity or independent. It was a, just a coalition of people about ideas. Mm -hmm. That's what made it rather interesting. So that, that struck you as wrong, and so you were uncomfortable with that. Um, how about the OSU campus speakers policy when they refused? Um... Well, that ignited things. Okay. And that, I mean, the, the ACLU thing, in my memory, 
and others may have more precise uh, thoughts, was just like, what? This, this, wait a minute, we don't understand this. But it didn't, you know, the campus didn't blow up. Right. But early on in Dr. Tom's tenure, and he was a new president about then, I think he only came in at 67 or 66 or 67. And when he, so he banned Thomas Altizer, the God is dead uh, minister. <laughs> you know, he was, I think he was, a, he was an ordained minister, but so he, that, that ban took place. And so that got people riled. And then it was a progressive series of... Because uh, there was a student committee right, that like, chose the speakers. Yeah. And you weren't involved with that, no, but you were no. in the Senate. And, and, um, and then it was, in, in truth, and uh, somebody talked about this last night, it was a, this, this was an issue that might have died, but it, again, it appeared that President Khan wanted to make a point and so every time there's an opportunity to let something slide, it seemed like the opposite tack was taken. So Al Pfizer was banned, and Leary was banned. Then uh, somewhere in there, the black student group went and by Adam Clayton Powell, and they announced it, and it was announced the next day he couldn't come. <laughs> it's like um, there was a series of things that's like mm -hmm. just built. And so that's when Ken and I, um, in the spring of 68, yeah, because it was during the, the campaign. We spent several months, probably started in February, I think, and just compiled a book of all the events and all the newspaper articles, pro and con, in Oklahoma and on the campus. And so we have, it's, it's really a history of the speaker policy writ through newspapers, letters to the editor, mm -hmm. um, not, not through any um, academic effort, I will say. And we put that together, and I'm just looking at it. it, it still kind of folds together. We just wrote little introductory sections saying, okay, this is about this section, this is about the Leary event, this is about the Powell event. Mm -hmm. And we sent it to John Kenneth Galbraith, who at that time was a very distinguished economist from Harvard, and we were unaware that he had been, they had been working for a year to get him in the Great Speakers Program. We wrote and said, we just don't who, think... Who had been working? The committee? The committee. The, the student the, the committee. Great, I think it's called the Great Speakers, Dr. Kroll, I think it was, in the Great Speakers Committee. Or that. Okay. So, um, we wrote and said, we would like for you to uh, not come to mm -hmm. support this policy. Mm -hmm. and, this, this was two months of work, and then we sent it off, pledging our sacred honor to each other as we signed. Uh, and I, I, I read... In protest. Of the in protest of this. Repression. And saying to him, you know, we're putting our careers at stake. We didn't realize we maybe were. I mean, we think we knew we were, we knew it was tense, but... Uh -huh. uh, so we sent it, and then we didn't hear, and then we got a telegram saying that he would certainly have to come because he could not uh, essentially give up the opportunity to watch in person this sort of idiotic thinking. It was a very sarcastic telegram. So we thought, well, okay, we'll take that. And then two weeks later, he sent another telegram saying he had considered it more and he just could not come at that time because it would seem to support the program, but that he would come anytime in the future for free. What a great response. Oh, it was a brilliant response. <laughs> so that, that, that telegram is in the archives here, and David has that. Um, and then a number of things happened that were not typical for college seniors hoping to graduate. So Ken and I had to come back to campus and a couple of professors, I think Dr. Richard Cummins was, uh, he was an engineering professor, but he was the head of the AAUP, the American Association of University Professors, which was a somewhat liberal wing on the campus and I think they were also, he or somehow the ACLU was involved. So he, um, con I contacted him and he had Ken and I come to the campus immediately, this is on spring break, and he said, we met him in his office, he said we're going over to the president's office right now, you have to tell him it's you, you have to tell him why, and we're going to go in and tell him, because nobody knows who it is, etc. 
It, so the president had found out about it how? Through the newspaper. Through the newspaper. Like everyone else. Okay. Big headlines. It was a big deal. Because there had been and a And the lot letters had been shared with the newspaper or... His telegram was his shared. His telegram was right. shared. I think he... Sh I don't know how it got out, actually. But it, they were quoting it extensively in the right. newspaper. Um, so then we went in and we told Dr. Kahn, who was very displeased. But we explained why we did it. Mm -hmm. He uh, expressed profound disappointment and thought it was a bad thing to do. But we didn't. So then we left. And then I'm just reviewing this again recently. And then Ken and I put out a press statement <laughs> the next day. I didn't remember that. So, so somebody must have guided us through all this. We put out a press statement under our name uh, explaining why we had done it. And the controversy simmered on for a while, but it moved more internally. To the, well, here it became internal, and I think there was a sense that the president wanted some students expelled, none specified. Ken and I always assumed we were on that list, or uh, we would have been expelled, others would have been allowed, not told not to return the next year. Uh, there was some admixture of that. And um, that it did not occur. And the dean named Frank McFarland, the guy who let me in, literally, was also the last bastion of my staying in, in my, my retelling of the story. Um, because he would not take action on these things. Mm -hmm. And then, Again, as the story goes, he was concerned about his long-term career, so he uh, accepted a, he moved from the administrative side to the, um, he accepted a position, a, a tenured position in education here. So, uh -huh. I mean, there, but it, there was that sense about the place at that time. And mm -hmm. this is, this, this seems relentlessly critical of Dr. Kahn, and we really disagreed with him. But he had his reasons, and he had his pressures, too. I mean, the regents were very supportive of him. If you go through this collection that Ken and I put together, most newspapers in the state mm -hmm. were very supportive of him. So having now spent 30 years as a CEO and in politics, I understand how hard it can be to deal with the various constituencies. In this instance, I did think, and I would... And I think, I continue to think that it was the wrong path. Mm -hmm. um, and it was one that Oklahoma State had to get behind it, which it did eventually, but not till the next year when someone followed us and sued <laughs> and, and won and on the speaker policy. So that's the way that went. A student sued? Yes, I don't know. I don't know the details of that story, but next year, the following year, someone I think a student, or it may have been an attorney, I should know this, um, was just kind of inspired by the work of the Fat Tax Group and everything that had gone into this. And uh, there was a lawsuit filed that eventually got the speaker policy, this, this regressive policy that had been articulated, um, could not be supported. Mm -hmm. So that was, that happened after I left. I didn't know that happened until I came back for this reunion. Wow. What about, uh, you mentioned Margaret uh, Brooks, mm -hmm. what about her role um, in, or your interactions with her? Well, Margaret was a professor um, and she was the advisor to the Student Senate. That was her main role. Okay. And she wrote very and thoughtful articles the and the director of the Honors Program. She also wrote a five-page series for the drummer. So, on academic freedom and thought and all of this. I think Margaret Brooks, as far as we knew, she was a, a bit of a gadfly to the administration because she articulated these points that were constantly not necessarily of their purview. But the precipitant came when they, they would not allow her to be the advisor to the student senate, which as a result of the um, Galbraith incident? No, no, this was before. This was before. This was before. So it was just another example of how to really, for 
gasoline on the fire mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were there were concerns about the speaker policy. There were concerns about things, but then basically she became a martyr to the cause and and she did i mean i think that you know her her career was truncated because of all of this too mm -hmm. so she was everyone's heroine appropriately so she was a real rock of integrity but um as one as someone commented i think ken ken commented in a letter in a text that he wrote for this, our little reunion, which I'm attending now and why I'm here for this interview, that the one thing he regrets is that all of us fail to appreciate the risk and the dangers the faculty went through in support of our naive idealism. Mm -hmm. And I think that's all of us in retrospect, each of us having been tested from minor to major ways, because there are a lot of academics here, uh, understand there was a lot at stake. For me personally, I was always worried about Dr. McFarland because I never knew what happened to him until the last few years, and I, I learned from my colleagues that you know he had a fairly happy ending in the College of Education, because I knew when I left, I left in trouble, and I left knowing that he was in trouble. Mm -hmm. And that had not played out by the time I graduated. Right. And by then, I was just another, you know, self-interested uh, college graduate. <laughs> Do you have any memories of the, um, the particular speakers that were invited to turn down, I guess? Uh, Hoffman or Rubin or...? Well, Hoffman and Rubin, that was the next year. Okay. Hoffman was the next year. Mm -hmm. And no, I never heard any of the speakers. <laughs> None could ever get here. None could ever get here. Right. So you could go to the Newman Center and hear Cesar Chavez. Fez and, and the Berrigans, you know, but you couldn't you couldn't go to Oklahoma State University and hear some of these people. Was that um, was your um, attendance at the Berrigan speaker event, was that really you were already feeling that ambivalent, but did that sort of cement your views, or...? I, I don't remember it being... I think, I think the Berrigans came, yeah. 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 that was about it. Yeah. Okay. And, the, and the free speech, the speech issue here was distinct from the war issue. So, there were not 6,000 people right. on the campus protesting the, the Vietnam War. Were there any? Yeah, there were protests there and there were comments, but but the, the free speech issue was the galvanizing issue 67 and 68. I mean, Vietnam was just a tortuous issue for everyone. Right. And there were many, there was some crossover, but the, the group that is uh, meeting uh, this weekend after 50 years of, 50, 50 years of careers, more or less following their beliefs that were expressed then, uh, that was mainly, it was mainly the free speech issue. Right. Do you have an opinion about Governor Bartlett's role when this broke, all this was going on? <laughs> yeah, it was only in reviewing some of the newspaper articles in preparation for this that I read about how he all the missteps he made, right along with President Kahn, and it was their belief, I, I, I got to affirm, and particularly in this era of free speech now, where we have sort of the opposite, mm -hmm. they were doing what they thought they should do. But Bartlett was, um, well, now Pfizer came, for instance. He was banned here and, and spoke at OU the same weekend. And George Cross was the president of OU at that time. And Bartlett praised Kahn and didn't mention Cross. And that was just a more politically expedient stance, in addition to which he may have you know, believed this um, as more than a political uh, venture. And the Senate, the state Senate, took up a resolution to, to write uh, a firm uh, speaker policy that was very restrictive. 
and then someone, I think the Attorney General, told them that they, they couldn't do that. It was unconstitutional. So there, it was, it seems simpler in retrospect, but um, they, they were tense times and people were on edge. Mm -hmm. There were the assassinations, there was a violence in the country. So it wasn't like these were tea and glee discussions, really. You know, they had implications for families everywhere. Everything had a ripple, and it was just, it was an uncomfortable time for the country. Right, there are all these currents uh, that they caught up in. Um, do you remember any of the um, black student protests? Well, I remember them. I remember some of the leaders, some of them were here. The, some of the stories I, I, don't, I wasn't even aware of when some of them went on and the black players, after the protest, the black basketball players were dropped from the team because they were, quote, late. And it's, you know, it's, there, were, there were events going on quite distinct from anything I knew about. Mm -hmm. Did honestly. that get coverage in the drummer, do you know? I don't know. I don't think that was a big issue. I don't. I, well, I looked at the drummers today. I don't remember that being, and I don't remember what year that was. Right. Depends. So, I just, it. I could. I would not want to be seen as, in any way, thinking I was a key part of any of this. I was just, a part of it. Right. And you know, circling in at times, swirling out at times, circling right. in, swirling out. Right, right. And um, I think the Galbraith event moved Ken and I to a prominence, probably not warranted. Um, I mean, Ken had been very much a leader in other ways around the campus, but the Galbraith event was just a very uh, uh, catalyzing event for, right. for us in, in terms of the whole process. What did you do after leaving OSU? What was your first step? My first step was to try to pass biophysics in medical school, <laughs> and I failed. At the University of Missouri. At the University of Missouri. I failed my first biophysics exam. That was my first big move after um, leaving uh, college. It took me a while to recover from that. I went to my professor, who was a crazy man, and it had been a very crazy exam, I must say, in retrospect. And he said, uh, it, I, I, think, I still think we have a chance to make it. <laughs> it was, like, it was not, not the encouragement I was looking for. In any case, so I went to medical school, and I, it was just a great choice for me. I've loved medicine. Uh, it's a, just an extraordinary privilege to be a physician. I never, ever ever regretted the opportunity to be a physician. So I finished medical school and then quite serendipitously became aware of the University of Rochester Medical School because two of the deans at Missouri were from uh, Rochester and made this little traverse starting in Atlanta and going up the, course, the, the coast and down through the Adirondacks. First time ever I had really done any of that as a little Oklahoma Traveled boy. that part of the mm -hmm. country. I remember coming down from Vermont through the Adirondacks, which was New York, thinking, mm -hmm. this is New York. And Rochester was just one of the very, one of the very top uh, programs at that time. Really a superb program. And uh, I was fortunate enough to get in. I applied. My wife, whom I had met, Karen, my wife, after shortly before I flunked that biophysics exam, <laughs> I think that was our introduction. <laughs> but in time, we had married. And so by the time I graduated, we had uh, um, a child, a dog, and a cat that we were going to have to move cross country. And she had never seen the place I, I had secured housing, I had done all this stuff, she had seen nothing. We just got in the car and drove. And, so, and then Rochester was a great experience for both of us. And then from Rochester to, to Cooperstown, and that's where we've been since.
it's just been a it's been a wonderful time and medicine has just been spectacular as a field social justice economics finance philosophy true it's really it's the it's the confluence mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of a lot of uh, the values that we were battling about long ago maybe not free speech i don't think that's been a big problem in medicine but social justice mm -hmm. i would say remains an issue in healthcare and that's really been a large part of my work what skills did you learn at OSU that you think um, played a role in your career well it, it, in I would say I always had some political instincts, but the student senate at Oklahoma State University, where votes mattered in our little world, I learned I learned how to get the votes in the student senate. <laughs> I would say as a career, as a small lab for training in a in a political career, it was a first step. Right. Um, really, you're in a really different. Uh, environment and climate up there mm -hmm. in New York State. It is, it is quite different. Um, I worry about Oklahoma. I worry about the investment in education in Oklahoma. The, I, know, I know all about Obamacare and the states that took it and the states that didn't. And in my opinion, it was so foolish not to take the Medicaid expansion. The exchanges are debatable, they can be fixed, but there's just an inherent cruelty in some of this politics, in my mind, that it has not, it really not been, it's all political, it had nothing to do with looking at people who have these needs. So, New York's just the opposite, I mean, we have an incredibly expanded Medicaid approach. We pay a lot of taxes to support that, but that's New York. That's the way it goes. You want to live there? That's <laughs> and and I could say the same for Oklahoma. That's we don't. That's mm -hmm. who we are. But there's just a lot of people left out mm -hmm. in the in the the roles here. I think in terms of healthcare, and in New York, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Now we we battle about how much it costs. I'm not sure what the battle is here, but it's not about who's covered. Mm -hmm. Enough editorializing there, but so I. But I mean, my sisters are here. My sisters are teachers. I've watched the, you know, the dollars reduce for education here, and it's 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 a different state than uh, the one in which I grew up. I would say. I think. I think. How important is it for you to stay in touch with the PNB Friday, Friday group? Um, it's not, in a way. I haven't seen these people in 50 years. And one of our comments... They've here, had three reunions, I guess. They've had three reunions, so you, much smaller them. reunions, and that's from what I understand. Mm -hmm. But First as I said, I was, I was a pretty peripheral player in know. all this. Um, some of them... I'd say the drummer group and, and the immediate, the first circle was the drummer group and then another circle and then a larger circle or a number of the rest of us. It was never a group that depended on each other for anything more than getting the work done in these areas and, mm -hmm. and using supplemental participants such as myself. So I, I think one of the questions that has resonated in the group is why everybody came. Why do you think they came? I think it was part curiosity and part validation to see what's happened to these people who felt so strongly then. And there's some curiosity about that. But the other part I would have to say has been the validation here. These people have done extraordinary things, the ones that have come back who were also at the center of what was going on. International things, diverse things, things in literature. Um, it's, it's, an, it's a group that maintained its commitment. And there's just something reaffirming. Mm -hmm. We heard Fred Harris, the former senator, speak last night to our group. He's 90 years old. His, his, he's brilliant. His memory, 
he required he recalls details of conversations with Lyndon Johnson and the jokes that were part of the conversation. It was a, it was a tour de force last night listening to him, and he was he was in a way one of our mentors and supporters through all of this because he was aware of it and he knew what was going on, and I think I believe he suggested to the legislature that they might reconsider some of their thinking. Well, that's interesting. Um, so it was just been a curiosity uh, and an affirmation in seeing people who, as young, naive idealists, are now aged idealists with uh, you know, artificial joints and a lot of life lessons uh, behind them. And in the group, uh, I mean, I feel privileged to be part of the group, but I, uh, I really feel like I'm, I have a very boring resume. You know, it's very linear. I mean, I, I did my job as a, in healthcare as a CEO and all this, and I'm, I'm proud of that work, but it's, it seems unimaginative <laughs> in this group. I will just say that. They've just done some amazing things, truly amazing things, these individuals. When you come back to campus and see the changes, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I ran around the campus today, and it's impressive. It means somebody's committing a lot of money to the bricks and mortar of education. It's the bricks and mortar part that I think we have to be careful about the bricks and mortar in education. And I don't mean just at Oklahoma State. It's like hospitals. Mm -hmm. We're putting billions of dollars into bricks and mortar, and the whole system is shifting away to ambulatory care, doing anything to avoid being near a hospital. There are pictures of you know, lecture halls at Stanford. It's an empty room, and it's not being facetious. That is the way the lectures are, are done. It's all electronic, et cetera. So that was one of my thoughts today, mm -hmm. that there are, first of all, there are people who are donating, and government's donating, and we're investing a lot in structure. And I. I is it, it's a legitimate question, it may be a naive question, but I think a legitimate one is, is that the model, the way we're going to educate in the future with all these new buildings? I mean, some, you need performing arts centers, you can, uh, and I guess we need engineering schools. I don't know, just a lot of construction. Mm -hmm. It's impressive. So I mean success, I guess. That's... And the, it's a sign of success, I'll put it that way. That enrollment means enrollment is good. And um, from what I understand, this is, this is a good university. It has good, I don't know. But those who seem to know think that it is. And when I was there here with Dr. Kahn and all of us, I would not have put Oklahoma State in the top rungs of universities then. Mm -hmm. but, I always felt that all you had to do was find the right professors, so I found them. I mean, that was my goal, to, to find the ones that were really the ones that would make your education rich, and Oklahoma State provided that to me. Well, thank you for your time today, and thank you for your contributions. <laughs> there weren't many. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>